Hello friends, uh, today we will be doing the current affairs for the 15th of March. Uh, 15th of March 2022. Okay, the first topic that we will be discussing is about inflation. It has crossed, uh, the results for February month have come in and it has crossed 6.07, it has crossed 6% uh, for the second consecutive month. Uh, when we discussed it for January last month, we had seen that it was at 6.01%, the retail inflation, uh, CPI. And uh, so this year again, uh, the retail inflation has crossed 6% to become 6.07%. Also, microfinance firms can fix interest rates at whatever interest rate they want to, as long as they are not usurious, which means that as long as they are not too high. And then uh, we'll discuss about the supplementary grants concept. Uh, and most of the other topics are pretty uh, straightforward. They're very static, except this maternal mortality rate, which we'll discuss about a little. And the 32 new roads, which India is planning to build along the border with China. The first uh, topic that we'll discuss is the retail inflation. Okay, so this is a chart of the consumer price index. Let me tell you what the consumer price index is. See, the consumer price index it measures inflation at the level of retail user, not at the level of wholesale users, okay, but rather at the level of retail users, which means you, me, anyone who's randomly going to a st st store or a shop to buy uh, commodities, they are the retail users. And hence automatically CPI, the basket, Okay, they take a basket of goods. This basket is filled with several commodities such as uh, vegetables, such as housing costs, such as footwear costs. Okay, these are the things which matter to a retail users. And they measure how much this basket has increased as compared to the previous year. They compare it to February 2021. They'll compare February 2022 with this February 2021 and they'll say uh, by how much percentage rates have increased by February 2022. That would be the inflation. Okay. So according to this consumer price index, this basket that we were talking about, this is the actual basket. In that food and beverages, they account for about 45%. And then about the housing, it accounts for 10%. Fuel and lighting accounts for 6.84%. Clothing and footwear accounts for 6.5%. Uh, then tobacco, intoxicants, pan, all of that account for 2.38%. And the other stuff is 28.32%. Uh, you need not go into what is this 28.32%. So if there is one of these statements which says that housing accounts for the largest percentage in a consumer price index basket, you have to mark that statement as wrong. Why? Because food accounts for it. Food and beverages account for 45%. Whereas when it comes to wholesale price index, what would be the uh, item which will have the highest weightage in the basket? See, because it is wholesale, it has to be at the industry level. And hence, manufacturing accounts for nearly 50% of the basket weight. Okay, now moving on. Why is it in the news? India's retail inflation inched up to an all-time uh, eight-month eight high of 6.07% in February from 6.01% in January, with rural India experiencing a sharper price rise at 6.38%. Therefore, rural India has a greater inflation which is happening as compared to urban India. And this is a big problem because rural India accounts for around 70% of India's population as compared to urban India, which accounts only for 30% of India's population. Okay, For urban consumers, the inflation rate in fact fell from 5.91% to 5.75% only in February. Which means that the pro products which are costing 100 rupees earlier in uh, January are costing uh, about 100 and you know, uh, products which are costing 100 rupees in February of 2021 are costing 106 rupees uh, 0.07 in this year, February 
2022 while when it comes to okay uh, and uh, in rural areas it is more than in the urban areas no more food prices saw an upward trajectory with inflation measured by the consumer food price index rising to 5.85% in february from 5.43% so food has also increased the inflation in food has increased as compared to january the trend was divergent for rural and urban india with the later which is urban india seeing a moderation in food inflation while rural food inflation shot up by 0.7 percentage points so even in terms of food okay the inflation in urban areas is less as compared to the inflation in uh, as compared to the inflation in rural areas food and beverages inflation hit a 15 month high and the rising prices of edible oils are likely to pose a challenge in the coming months why because as summer advances there'll be a more greater demand for vegetables and that will reduce or that will drive up the prices of vegetables and obviously vegetable oil edible oil and also during uh, currently during uh, the russia and ukraine uh, tensions you can see that there are supply chain disruptions which are happening because of which edible oils uh, we import sunflower from ukraine and because uh, the sunflower has been disrupted the prices of sunflower oil has also increased a lot okay then inflation in wholesale prices resurged to 13.11% in february after two months of mild cooling off staying above the 10% mark for the 11th month in a row now now the inflation the wholesale price index inflation has become 13.11% and it is staying over 10% for the 11th month in a row and that's a big number okay now consumer price index what is this consumer price index i have described it okay but uh, we'll go into more of the prelims perspective uh, description the monthly consumer price index components all india index food and uh, beverages makes up 45% like what we discussed services make up about 21% and housing makes up 10% so under the consumer price index services are a part whereas when it comes to wholesale price index there is no services services are not there it measures price changes from the perspective of a retail buyer okay and not a wholesaler as in the case of wpa also please remember that it is the consumer price index which the rbi monetary policy committee uses for changing the repo rates now if at all the consumer price index stretches to more than 6% then it is a problem for the rbi monetary policy committee because the mpc is expected to maintain the inflation between the ranges of 4 plus or minus 2 which means inflation has to be between the range of 2% to 6% now it is released by the national statistical office the cpi calculates the difference in the price of commodities and services such as food medical care education electronics with the indian consumers buy for use and it has several subgroups including food and beverages fuel and light housing and clothing bedding and footwear etc currently please remember that india has five consumer price indices like what we had discussed cpi rural cpi urban and apart from that we have cpi industrial workers cpi agricultural laborers cpi rural laborers okay these three are released by the labor ministry while the normal cpi urban and rural are released by the national statistical office okay now these three indices are compiled by the labor bureau in the ministry of labor and employment now this uh, consumer price index agricultural laborer and consumer price index rural laborer are used to fix minimum wages for agricultural laborers and rural unskilled employees while cpi industrial worker is used to fix the dearness allowance for a worker working in industries so please remember what indices are used for what also please remember that it is the cpi agricultural laborer 
this is what is used for fixing the wages for mg narega this is a very important uh, tidbit only by looking at how much the cpa agricultural laborer uh, has increased will the wages for mg narega be varied also what is the difference between every cp every index let it be cpi let it be wpi all of them have both the core inflation and they have the uh, headline inflation the headline inflation is the total inflation it is based on all the components of the cpi while the core inflation it is headline inflation minus inflation and food and energy related uh, stuff why because food and energy related price shocks are transitory okay they are mainly supply driven and therefore they cannot be controlled by R rbi's monetary policy tools they are not within the individual country's control they are dependent on several factors and hence individual countries and rbi can't do anything about it and that's why to understand the actual extent of inflation it is better to exclude these things and measure uh, inflation minus food and fuel that is known as cpi core okay now how do you fight inflation both the rbi as well as the central government try to fight inflation because rbi uh, because inflation is not good for the common man now uh rbi it takes up either the tight money policy or the dear money policy or the hawkish monetary policy if it takes any of these policies it will increase the interest rates increase the interest rates and once the interest rates are increased loans will become more expensive and this will reduce the liquidity or reduce the free float of money which is there in the economy thereby reducing inflation automatically and the central government it can take up several steps such as tax deduction exemption subsidy benefits towards producers to decrease the cost of production if the cost of production is reduced automatically the supply you know it will be cheaper and hence a uh, lesser amount of money would be needed to buy these products it it will reduce inflation automatically or if the government itself reduces its fiscal deficit which means that it reduces its spending then it can reduce inflation curtailing schemes subsidies that increase the money in the hands of beneficiaries without increasing production that is one thing ordering the rbi to issue inflation index bonds sovereign gold bonds and also by using essential commodities act stock limits minimum export price fci's open market sale scheme operation greens price stabilization fund all these are used to increase the supply and when you have a stable supply there is not more money that is chasing few goods rather there is enough goods and then automatically inflation will reduce so we need to increase our production okay the other big news for today is microfinance firms can fix interest rates now first of all try to understand what microfinancing is and what are microfinance institutions so microfinance institutions are nothing but financial companies mfis are financial companies like nbfc microfinancial institutions okay now mfis are financial companies which provide small loans to people who do not have any access to banking they offer basically small loans to people who don't have any don't have banking facilities or they offer financial services to low income populations okay these are usually low income populations they offer loans to low income populations why because these people don't have sufficient banking facilities so they are provided small loans and they are provided to low income populations okay now this it can be in the form of micro loans it can be in the form of micro savings it can be in the form of micro insurance all of them are micro 
as the name suggests it is for people with low income and again these are smaller loans okay now the reserve bank of india on monday has allowed microfinance institutions to fix interest rates on loans with the caveat that the rates should not be usurious it should not be exploitative it should not be too high now what are these microfinance institutions okay before beginning everything i'll just tell you the background based on the maligam committee recommendations the rbi came out with detailed guidelines for microfinance institutions these guidelines introduced a new category called nbfcs nbfc microfinancial institution and hence these guidelines which were set by the rbi they had set norms for income criteria for clients of mfis repayment period borrower loan limits interest rate norms and caps limits on the number of lenders to a borrower and a host of other norms and criteria hence all these criterion was there only for nbfc mfis microfinance institutions okay so nbfc mfis were under tremendous pressure to follow all these rules while providing lending of money however later on you know several banks and several small financial banks payment banks they all got into this microfinance space SFBs, P payment banks, etc. Okay, so several of these units got into microfinance sector, but they were not regulated uh, as under the same rules that were applicable to NBFC MFIs. And now that is a divergence because these uh, companies they don't have as many rules and regulations to follow. well these companies have so many rules and regulations to follow and hence the rba has been trying to reduce the burden on nbfc mfis in order to increase the microfinance lending okay so what are these revised guidelines the revised guidelines which will take effect on april 1st 2022 state that rba has tweaked the definition of microfinance loan to indicate a collateral free loan given to a household with annual income of up to 3 lakh rupees see we spoke about low income population so these uh, earlier it was just about 1.2 lakh rupees per rural borrowers and 2 lakhs for urban borrowers and now this amount has been increased to rupees 3 lakh uh, irrespective of where it is so if a household is earning up to 3 lakhs it is eligible for a microfinance loan which is collateral free in nature okay as per the revised norms regulated entities should put in place a board approval policy regarding pricing of the microfinance loan a ceiling on the interest rate and all other charges applicable to microfinance loans so it is the board which is fixing rather than rbi which is fixing the interest rates it is the board that fixes the interest rates as well as the ceiling caps on interest rates etc each regulated entity shall disclose disclose pricing related information to a prospective borrower in a standardized simplified fact sheet any fees to be charged on the microfinance borrower by the registered entity uh, or its partner agent shall be explicitly disclosed in the fact sheet this fact sheet it shall be disclosed the borrower shall not be charged any amount which is not explicitly mentioned in the fact sheet so by this RBI is increase, increasing the transparency by saying that when you offer any loans to borrowers you have to ensure that uh, whatever is the pricing related information it has to be provided in a fact sheet and all the fees that are to be charged are to be explicitly mentioned in that fact sheet and also no amount which is not there in that fact sheet can be additionally charged each regulated entity will have to put in place a mechanism for identification of borrowers facing repayment related difficulties and further engagement with such borrowers and providing them necessary guidance about recourses available so each regulated entity if at all they have certain people who are suffering from difficulties in payment of the loans okay they should ensure that there is proper engagement with these borrowers and they should make these borrowers be aware of the other avenues of repayment of loans okay also the regulated entity will provide the details of recovery agents so that random people don't trouble those uh, borrowing uh, those who are taking microfinance loans and they also know that 
they are providing their details and their money to the registered recovery agents and not to anybody randomly. There shall be no prepayment penalty on microfinance loans. If I am paying a loan before the due date, then there should not be any fine on me. Also, penalty, if any, for delayed payment shall be applied on the overdue amount and not the entire loan amount. This is very self-explanatory. If I have paid X percentage of my Y loan, okay, then only on the amount that is left that I'll be paying my interest. I won't pay the interest on the entire loan, which is Y. Any change in interest rate or other change shall be informed to the borrower well in advance and these changes shall be effect only prospectively. So if at all there is any change in the interest rates, okay, they shall be conveyed to the borrower well in advance. And these uh, change in interest rates shall be applicable only from then on rather than from the past. Rather than going into the past and saying that for the last three years also you have to pay this increased interest rate. It will only happen from the uh, that point. Interest rates and other charges, fees on microfinance loans should not be usurious. These shall be subjected to scrutiny by the Reserve Bank. They cannot be any random thing. They cannot be there to trouble the people who have taken the loans. And they shall be under the uh, supervision of the RBA. Okay. Now, these microfinance lending is extremely important. Please remember that around you know in the last few decades this microfinance lending has increased by a tremendous amount okay and it is currently serving around 102 million accounts 102 million accounts are being served by microfinance lending uh, uh, if you remember the Grameen Bank which was led by Professor Muhammad Yunus got the Nobel Prize for uh, providing microfinance uh, lending in Bangladesh. So microfinance is extremely important to pull people out of poverty. As you can see over here, financial institutions, let it be NBFC, MFIs or donors or private equity, they provide money to these MFIs, microfinance institutions, which further lends it to SHGs, which are groupings of women or groupings of men. And they further lend it to people. And hence, this is the way to go about pulling people out of poverty. Moving on. Supplementary demand for grants. The government has sought approval from parliament to spend an extra 1.07 lakh crores in the current fiscal year. The additional spending of rupees 1.58 trillion is required for expenditure commitments towards settling loans taken from National Small Savings Fund for PM Awaz Yojana and higher fertilizer subsidy outgo. Okay, what are su supplementary demands for grants? The supplementary demand for grants is needed for government expenditure over and above the amount for which the parliamentary approval was already approved during the budget session. So here, if at all during the original budget session, if at all the demand for grants was taken for some amount of money, but we need more money over the course of the year in order to accomplish the task. In that case, we go for supplementary grants or we go for additional grants. Okay. Now, what are the constitutional provisions? These supplementary grants, additional grants, excess grants, votes on account, votes on credit and exceptional grants are all mentioned in the constitution. Please remember this. They're all given within the constitution. Article 115 and Article 116. While supplementary grants, additional grants and excess grants are given in Article 115 itself, vote down account, votes of credit and exceptional grants are given in Article 116. We will discuss what these different different grants are. Now, supplementary grant. It is granted when the amount authorized by the Parliament through the Appropriation Act for a particular service for that current year is found to be insufficient for that year. It is not enough and hence you need a higher amount of spending in order to accomplish the task. Then the government goes for supplementary grant. Similarly, additional grant is granted when a need has arisen during the current financial year for an additional expenditure upon some new service not contemplated in the budget. 
while the supplementary grant is basically for a service which has been mentioned in the demands for grants and the service does not have enough money not enough money while in the case of additional grant this demand for grant has not even been mentioned in the appropriation bill and there has been no money that has been taken out but it is a new entity which uh, is required okay and hence there is an additional uh, demand there is an additional grant for that money uh, to accomplish that new task which has arisen okay while these two tasks are actually completed before uh, they are completed before the end of the financial year they are com- okay mm, they are completed before uh, march of that particular uh, financial year which means that if it is the uh, year 2019-20 these particular grants have to be voted and approved before 2020 march while in the case of excess grants they are granted when the money has been already spent on any service during the financial year in excess of the amount granted for that service so basically if at all the spending for some particular uh, task or grant has exceeded what has been allowed for that particular grant in that case excess grant comes up it is voted by the lok sabha after the financial year while this happens before the financial year is over this happens after the financial year okay after the financial year before the demands for excess grants are submitted to the lok sabha for voting they must be approved by the public accounts committee this public accounts committee only approves the excess grants and then after that only they are voted by the lok sabha similarly even the comptroller and auditor general goes through these excess grants now what is vote of credit vote of credit is granted for meeting an unexpected demand we don't know what the cost of that particular demand would be in that condition vote of credit is given when an account of the magnitude or the indefinite character of that particular service the demand cannot be stated within the details given in a budget hence it is like a blank check you are giving a blank check because you don't know how much that particular service is going to cost and you say okay here uh executive you take any amount of money and get this task done exceptional grant it is granted for a special purpose and forms no part of the current service of any financial year next token grant okay please remember token grant it is granted when funds to meet the proposed expenditure on a new service can be made available by reappropriation what is reappropriation it means moving the grants from one service to and other service grant for one to grants for two from one service if you are just moving the grants to another service without having to you know uh, further pull out any money from the consolidated fund of india by just adjusting these grants then it is known as a token grant a demand for the grant of a token sum of rupees 1 is submitted to the vote of the lok sabha and if assented the funds are made available reappropriation involves transfer of funds from one head to another it does not involve any additional expenditure like what we had just discussed petroleum and natural gas regulatory board okay the kerala state road transportation corporation argued in the supreme court that the petroleum and natural gas regulatory board act of 2006 mandated the constitution of an independent authority to fix the fuel prices in the country now what is this pngrb petroleum and natural gas regulatory board it was established in the year 2006 under the same act and its mandate is to regulate the refining processing storage transportation distribution marketing and sale of petroleum petroleum products natural gas okay excluding the production only production is not included everything else refining processing storage transportation distribution marketing and sale everything is included under the mandate of the pngrb apart from production of crude oil and natural gas why to ensure an uninterrupted and adequate supply of petroleum and petroleum products and natural gas all throughout the country it also ensures enough supply across the country 
and it helps to foster fair trade, protect the consumer interest and authorize companies that will build and operate fuel pipelines. Now, this PNGRB, according to the act that was created, it consists of a chairperson. It comprises of a legal member, comprises of three other members. So, it is basically a five-member body. It has the powers of a civil court and bench uh, comprising legal member and one or more members nominated by the chairperson decides on the disputes amongst downstream companies or with outsiders. So, it has two member benches, one of whom is a legal member and the other one is a normal member. Now, please remember that the appellate body for this PNGRB is the appellate tribunal on uh, appellate tribunal for electricity aptel the appellate tribunal under the electricity act will serve as the appellate tribunal for pngrb it is the same appellate tribunal don't get confused just because it is for electricity please remember it okay the next topic that we'll be doing is the credit guarantee scheme for subordinate debt okay uh, why is it in the news? The credit guarantee scheme for subordinate debt has been extended now. Now, when was the first time that the government announced the uh, the credit guarantee scheme was? Uh, when it created this distressed assets fund. Subordinate debt for stressed MSMEs under the Atmanir Par Bharat package. After that, a scheme called credit guarantee scheme for subordinate debt was launched in 2020 to provide credit facility through lending institutions to the promoters of stressed MSMEs, those with uh, loans which are in SMA 2 stage and NPA accounts, who are eligible for restructuring as per RBI guidelines. What this means is that the first time that this credit guarantee scheme was launched was after the creation of a distressed assets fund. This fund itself was created as a subordinate debt, debt fund for stressed MSMEs. It was created with a idea of helping out those MSMEs which are in trouble. Now, credit guarantee scheme for subordinate debt was launched for those MSMEs in SMA2 and NPA conditions. So, when any company okay, it misses out on the uh, deadline to pay either the interest or the principal for on the first day, okay, it misses it out. Okay, and after 90 days, if it continues to miss out on paying the principal or the interest rate, then it is classified as an NPA, non-performing asset. However, between the first to uh, one to 30 days, it is known as an SMA zero. And from 30 to 60 days, it is known as SMA1. And beyond those 60 days, it is known as SMA2 account. Now, as per this credit guarantee uh, scheme, guarantee cover of worth 20,000 crores will be provided to the promoters who can take debt from the banks to further invest in their stressed MSMEs as equity. The scheme will be operationalized through credit guarantee fund trust for MSMEs. Okay. So, the thing is that under this scheme, the guarantee cost for these subordinate loans will be paid by the government and that guarantee cover for which, I mean, loans can be taken for 20,000 crores and for this, the guarantee cost will be paid by the government through what the credit guarantee uh, fund trust for MSMEs. This will be paying that guarantee cost. And these uh, non-performing MSMEs can take these loans and they can inject it as equity in order to revive their businesses. How is the scheme implemented? The promoters of MSMEs will be given credit equal to 15% of their stake or rupees 75 lakhs, whichever is lower, the promoters in turn will infuse this amount into the MSME unit as equity and thereby enhance the liquidity and maintain the debt to equity ratio sufficiently. 
90% guarantee coverage for this sub debt will come from the scheme itself while 10% would come from concerned promoters. So 90% of the guarantee cost will be paid by credit guarantee fund trust for MSMEs, CGTMSE, while the rest 10% will be paid by the promoters. There will be a moratorium of 7 years on the payment of principal while the maximum tenure for repayment will be 10 years for the scheme. Okay, for 7 years they don't need to pay, do any payment while the maximum time for repayment is 10 years. Mm. Maternal mortality ratio in India. Please know that the maternal mortality rate is nothing but the number of mothers who are dying for 1 lakh proper deliveries of children. That is the maternal mortality rate. Now, why is it in the news? The maternal mortality ratio of India has declined by 10 points, says the Registrar General of India. Who is the Registrar General of India? He is appointed under the Ministry of Home. Please remember that this Registrar General of India is not under the Ministry of Statistics, rather under the Ministry of Home. And he is there for taking a note of all the important data like census, okay, like this maternal mortality rate, etc. It has declined to, according to the news, it says that the maternal mortality rate has declined to from 113 in 2016-18 to 103 in 2017-19, an 8.8% decline. It is a very big number. Okay, uh, why? Because if you remember, in the SRS sample registration survey 2014 to 2016, the maternal mortality rate was 130. And now between 2015 to 16, that reduced to 122. And between 2016 to 2018, it further reduced to 113. And now in 2019, uh, I mean, 2017 to 2019, it further reduced to 103. So, can you see that the numbers are reducing in a decreasing manner from 130 to 103 today, which is a very big number. And hence, there is a persistent decline. India is on the verge of achieving the national health policy target of 100 per lakh live births by 2020. And it is also on the track to achieve the sustainable development goal. Target of 70 per lakh live births by 2030. Okay, the number of states that have achieved the sustainable development goal targets are Kerala, it has only 30 maternal mortality, Maharashtra 38, Telangana 56, Tamil Nadu 58, Andhra Pradesh 58, Jharkhand 61 and Gujarat 70. These are the states which have already achieved this SDG goal. And there are 9 states which have achieved the MMR rate which have been set by the national health policy which is 100. Uh, which includes these states. Along with that, we have Karnataka which has 83 and Haryana which has 96. There are some states which are not performing so well, which are Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Assam, which have a ratio of more than 150, while the other states of India are somewhere between 100 to 150, including Bihar. So these states are doing worse. They are having a ratio of more than 150. Gallium nitride. A gallium nitride ecosystem enabling center and incubator has been set up in Bangalore. The facility is jointly set up by the Ministry of Electronics and IASC Bangalore. Now, what is gallium nitride? It is believed to be the second most important material after silicon for electronic chips. Okay. Now, the properties of gallium nitride are that it has a high heat capacity. It has sensitivity to ionizing radiation which is very low and then it has a faster switching speed, higher thermal conductivity and lower on resistance. Okay, moving on applications. Okay, before this also please remember that gallium nitride transistors, they can operate at much higher temperatures and work at much higher voltage. Okay, they can work at higher temperature and higher voltage. Okay, so they have a high heat capacity again. 
sensitivity to ionizing radiation is low, faster switching speed and higher thermal conductivity. You can use this uh, gallium nitride because its ionizing radiation is low, it makes it suitable material for solar cells, for satellites. Uh, as the sensitivity is low, it does not get affected by this ionizing radiation and hence it can be used as, uh, as a material in the solar cell arrays. Mm, like what we said, uh, gallium nitrate can be used in semiconductors, can be used in transistors. Okay. Also, gallium nitrate based electronics has the potential to cut energy consumption. Gallium nitrate electronics, they consume lesser energy, consume less energy as compared to normal electronics. Less energy. Okay. Also, you have gallium nitrate nanotubes, which are you know, proposed for applications in nanoscale electronics. Okay, so several applications exist. It is a semiconductor commonly used in LEDs. Gallium nitrate technology is of strategic importance with the application in the field of 5G, space, defense, and it plays a key role in enabling e-vehicles and wireless communication. However, there are some downsides of using gallium nitrate, which is that it is a very high cost item and uh, thus it makes it not uh, probable okay also companies are more used to silicon products okay and hence the sudden switch to gallium nitride can mean that all these companies semiconductor companies they need to switch a lot more of their operations in order to get accom accustomed to gallium nitride now moving on in the Rajasabha, the government had held that 32 new roads were coming up along the Chinese border. Post Galwan, the government of India sanctioned 32 roads along the China border, of which work has started on 8 roads, as according to government in the Rajasabha. The Ministry of Home Affairs informed the parliamentary panel that 32 helipads were also being constructed and upgraded along the Indo-Chinese border. However, this parliamentary standing committee to which the uh, Rajya Sab, uh, to which the Ministry of Home Affairs had informed all of this information, had held that this Home Ministry had demanded around three thousand six hundred crores in the budget for border infrastructure in the upcoming fiscal. Though the Home Ministry was only able to spend around fifty percent of the allocated budget till uh, December twenty twenty one in the last year. Okay, in the last year the Ministry of Home could spend only 50% of the allocated budget. And hence, why is the Ministry of Home asking for more than 3,500 crores again this year? So for that, the Ministry had informed uh, the Parliamentary Panel, the Parliamentary Standing Committee, that to improve the existing infrastructure and to enhance the operational capabilities of security forces, the government had undertaken various projects and schemes in the past few years along the Chinese border. And that is the reason why it was needing more number of funds. Okay, there was this uh, project called the Indochina Border Roads Phase 1 project, under which the construction of 25 roads measuring 751 kilometers, which costed around 3,400 crores, was taken up earlier. You know, this was done in the year 2005 in order to improve the infrastructure. The first phase was initiated in the year 2005 when it was decided that the MCA that the M MHA would construct 27 priority roads totaling 600 kilometers. This has actually gone to more than 608 ki more than 608 kilometers to so 751 kilometers. However, okay, now the money, this additional money of 3,500 crores, is being used for the second phase of the ICBR, which was approved in September 21st, 2020. Months after, 20 Indian soldiers were killed in the clashes with the Chinese People Liberation Army in Eastern Ladakh. And hence, these funds will be used for this ICBR-2, which is nothing but Indochina Border Roads Phase 2. Phase 2, okay. 
So this is the function of a parliamentary standing committee. It has to question different different ministries regarding you know the expenses that they are demanding and regarding the work that has been done regarding these uh, demanded expenses.